بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وخاتم النبيين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Respect to listeners as promised inshallah today we will be briefly discussing the companion Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu anhu Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu anhu's name was actually Jundub the son of Junada Jundub ibn Junada radiyallahu anhu more famously known as Abu Dhar. <coughs> there are a number of reasons for discussing this famous companion. <coughs> One, he was a very scholarly individual. One of the earliest Muslims. Someone beloved to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam someone whom the Prophet ﷺ told others to love. He was trusted by the Messenger And his position was such that even though the rest of the Sahaba disagreed with him, and he strongly disagreed with them, on numerous occasions. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu position was such, he was held in such esteem and respect that the other Sahaba radiyallahu anhum wouldn't say anything to him. And the one or two who did reply to him, even they were careful as to what they said to him and how much they said to him. And the reason for their difference will come to light when, inshallah, I will discuss a few points. Most importantly, though, he is remembered for his asceticism, for his shunning of wealth, for his following in the footsteps of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in such a way that none of the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhu, could match him in the asceticism and in the shunning of the dunya. He was a very strong character, strong, strong of character, strong of will, even unrelenting of tongue. So he would say whatever he wanted to, to anyone. And one of the reasons was that Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu an was a very simple Bedouin from the tribe of Ghifar. And I do not say that disparagingly. If one, studied, if one remembers his background and the tribe he was from, one can understand his nature. He was from the Ghifar tribe, the Banu Ghifar. And the Ghifar tribe they lived in an area called Rabada and its surroundings. Rabada was approximately 120 miles east of Medina, in the deserts. Now the Banu Ghifar, they were on the trade routes between Mecca, Medina, and Iraq, and Persia. One. They were also on that caravan route for pilgrims, even before Islam and the non when the Arab pagan pilgrims would travel to Hajj, those travelling from the northeastern or eastern regions would 
inevitably pass through the settlements or the areas normally inhabited and occupied by the Rifar tribe. And the Rifar tribe was such that even the other Bedouins considered them to be Bedouins. And they were notorious for being highway robbers, raiders, and they would raid and ransack caravans of trade, and even caravans of Hajj. This is before Islam. And this is why when Abu Dhar al-Ghifari first met the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he greeted him. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, who are you and where are you from? So he said, I am Abu Dhar and I am from the tribe of Ghifar. <coughs> So the Prophet ﷺ placed his noble hand and fingers on his forehead. In, in a manner that anyone would if, for instance, they are given some news which makes them think. So when he said to him, which tribe are you from? Which people? He said, from the Ghifar tribe, Prophet ﷺ immediately put his noble hands on his forehead. Abu Bakr was with him, and again, as I said, he... It was very simple. So when the Prophet ﷺ placed his noble hand on his forehead, he actually stretched his hand out to pull it away. He, he stretched his hand out to the Prophet ﷺ's hand to pull it away from his forehead. Abu Bakr was with them, and Abu Bakr placed his hand on his hand to stop him. And again, another way of understanding him was one of the tabi'een, one of the successors to the Sahaba radiyallahu anhu, al-Ahnaf ibn Qais. He says that, al-Ahnaf says that one day I visited Medina and I came across a very large group of the Quraysh seated. And what he means by a large group of the Quraysh, this is after the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that The leaders of the Quraysh, who are all now Muslim, we're talking about the senior Sahaba radiyallahu anhum from amongst the Quraysh, they were seated in Medina, in one of their gatherings, when he says, suddenly a man rough of clothes, rough of appearance, rough of face, came to them and stood over them and began talking to them harshly, mentioning things about hoarding wealth and what will happen to the hoarders of wealth on the day of reckoning. And he said, even though these were the leaders of the Quraysh amongst the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the most they did was they lowered their heads in silence and they listened to what he had to say, but no one responded. And then he went away. So I went after him and I said to him, who are you? And it's evident that what you said to these people, they did not like. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari identified himself and he said, my Khalil, my friend, my best friend Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told me and then he spoke about hoarding wealth and he said they know just as I know but they do not understand so this was Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu and he was very straightforward in fact again as we will learn from the uh, from his hadith or from his story of converting to Islam <coughs> Because he was from the Ghifar tribe, the Prophet وسلم, even when he, when he heard that he's from the Banu Ghifar, he placed his noble hands on his forehead. Because the Banu Ghifar, were not, well, they were notorious. Notorious for robbing trade caravans and even the Hajj caravans. And the other Arabs, though they were prone to fighting each other, they would normally cease fighting in the Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum, in the sac- four sacred months. But the Ghifar, to them, it wouldn't matter whether it was a sacred month or not. 
they would carry on with their raids. And even Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu anhu, long before he embraced Islam, in his younger days, he was a raider, just like the rest of his tribe. And he raided other tribes, and sometimes he would carry out these raids, not in a party, but single-handedly. One way of understanding the Arabs before Islam is similar. Well, one way of understanding them is, is to look at other pagan <coughs> tribal societies all over the world. I'm not comparing them, because of course many of them became Sahaba radiallahu anhum, but I'm speaking about the days before Islam. In order to understand the setting in which Islam came, one has to look at the Arabs in a certain way. And we have various reports about them, which on the surface appear to be contradictory. We know about the Arabs that they would carry out raids against each other. Yet they were very hospitable. So on the one hand, they would pillage and plunder. And they would carry out raids against tribes known to them, against their fellow Arabs. And it was almost a sport. They raided. The others raided. They were valiant. They were courageous. They were very reckless. At the same time, they had a strange tradition of nobility, of, hospita of hospitality, of honour and dignity. They, as I've said on many occasions, they believed in the concept of juar. So the same people who, at a drop, would raid other tribes and carry off men, women and children and animals, and livestock, and pillage and plunder. The same people, if someone asked for their protection, they would give one word, and they would actually give their lives in order to protect this one stranger. So we have contradictory reports. On the surface, they appear to be contradictory. But the best way of understanding them is to look at other pagan tribal societies all over the world. And to give you some examples, the Red Indians in the Americas, the Vikings in Europe, the Mongols in Asia. These are all hardened warrior tribes. They lived in rough conditions, in hospitable conditions, and they were molded and formed accordingly. They had they would raid sometimes even as a sport. They were all guilty of plunder and pillage. And yet they had various traditions of honour and dignity. They had a strict tribal hierarchy. And in all of these societies, they showed great deference and respect to the elders. So just as the Arabs would show respect to their chieftains and their elders. You'll find the same traditions amongst the Mongolians, amongst the European Vikings, and amongst the Red Indians in the Americas. And these are just examples. Of course, there are many of the similar tribal societies, such as in Africa. But these, these are very good examples of understanding them. On the surface, we have these contradictory, contradictory bits of information about them, but they were all very similar. And another thing, which united all of these pagan tribal societies was their pagan religions. The paganism to be found amongst the Red Indians, amongst the European Vikings, amongst the Eastern Mongols, was very similar to the paganism to be found amongst the Arabs. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was from this pagan Bedouin Arab tribe of Ghifar, which was even looked down upon by the other Arab tribes. The other Bedouin considered them to be Bedouins. And he himself would be party to these raids, sometimes as a group, sometimes individually. In any case, later, he, through his own, of his own accord, he came to 
a very great understanding. And even before the arrival of Islam, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu and despite his past life, he shunned idolatry. He shunned this way of life. And he broke off from his people. And something stirred in him. And even before the Prophet وسلم, announced his prophethood, he himself says, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu an, that for three years before becoming a Muslim and even hearing about the Messenger, وسلم, he said, I prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for three years. And he would pray all night long. Of course, it wasn't the salah or the prayer as we know it, because he hadn't even met the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But whichever manner he prayed in, he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a whole three years. Then, when he disagreed with his people, he moved away closer to Mecca. And there he learned about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he sent his younger brother Unais radiyallahu an to Mecca. And his younger brother was a poet. So he said, go and find out more about this man. So Unais radiyallahu an went to Mecca, made inquiries. By this time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had announced Islam and proclaimed it. He then returned and he informed the, his brother Abu Dhar radiyallahu an about what he had seen and heard. But it wasn't sufficient information for Abu Dhar. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu anhu said that I took my belongings and my staff and I made my way to Makkah al-Mukarramah. When he arrived there, remember this was in the early days when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had pronounced Islam, but it was very difficult for people to believe because of the opposition and the persecution. So, and anyone who did embrace, they would give him the title of Sabi, meaning heathen. So the Prophet so Abu Dhar al-Ghifari arrived in Mecca al-Mukarramah and upon his arrival he went to the masjid and he began inquiring about the Prophet وسلم, or looking out for him but he didn't detect him. Then he once publicly asked someone who's this Sabi that you refer to? Who's this heathen that everyone talks about? So the person who he asked, he became suspicious as to why is this person asking. So he suddenly started shouting, here's another heathen. So people fell upon Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu an, the Quraysh, and they beat him severely until he himself says, I was like a red, reddened idol. And the meaning of, or a reddened altar meaning the altars of sacrifice, when they would sacrifice animals on there, it would be covered in dripping blood. So he says that I looked like an idol or, a, or an altar of sacrifice. That's how red and blooded I was because of the beating. Simply because I had asked someone, who's this heathen that you talk about? And he just wanted to find out about the Prophet wasallam. So the person turned on him and shouted, this is another heathen. So he was beaten. But being the Bedouin that he was, of that hardened Bedouin tradition, he say he, he dragged himself, picked himself up, dragged himself to the well of Zimzum and thoroughly washed himself. By this time his provisions had run out. And he says he then began waiting and searching for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for almost a whole month. He had no food, no one would entertain him. And for one month he says, I lived off only the water of Zimzum. But he said it was so nourishing. It's a hadith of Sahih Muslim. He says it was so nourishing that I actually became quite corpulent and large because of the water of Zamzam alone in one whole month. Then he says one day late at night, it was a moonlit night, people, it was late, people had retired to their homes, to their beds. And there was no one in the haram except for two ladies who were performing tawaf. So he was there, and these two women were performing tawaf. So as they were performing tawaf, they were calling out to two gods, two idols, Isaf and Na'ilah. And 
Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu an heard them calling out to these two gods, Isaf and Na'ilah. And as I mentioned in Kitab al-Hajj, in the Book of Pilgrimage, from the commentary of Sahih al-Bukhari, a number of years ago, Isaf was a man, a young man, and Na'ilah was a young woman. The Arabs believed, and this is paganism, the Arabs believed about both of them, Isaf and Na'ilah, that Isaf and Na'ilah had both committed adultery in, in the Haram, and according to some reports, in the Kaaba. And then they were both turned to stone. So the pagans made them into gods. Isaf and Na'ila. So, and they began worshipping them. So these two women were calling out to Isaf and Na'ila and worshipping them. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu heard them, he became quite annoyed. And he shouted out at those two women, why don't you marry one to the other? <laughs> Meaning, why don't you marry Isaf to Na'ila? So they were quite shocked, but they carried on with their tawaf. And when they came round again through another circuit, this time Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu an said something which I cannot repeat, which was quite obscene. So the both women started screaming, and they actually broke off their tawaf and ran from the Masjid al-Haram. So, when they ran, late at night, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu an were descending into the area of the Haram. And when they saw these two women fleeing and screaming, wailing, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what's happened? So they both said, there's a man there near the Kaaba and he, he just said something. What did he say to you? So they both said, which is difficult to translate into English, but he, he said a mouthful to us, which no more can be said. He said something beyond which he can't say anything. And that was Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu's very harsh and abrupt and coarse of tongue as well. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa came down to the Kaaba and they performed the tawaf. That's when Abu Dhar al-Ghifari approached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he says, I said salam to him first. So I said, assalamu alaykum. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa returned his greeting. He asked him, who are you and where are you from? When he said, I am Jundub Abu Dhar and I'm from the tribe of Ghifar, that's when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did this. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu and being who he was, he actually went to remove the hand of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Abu Bakr radiallahu and stopped him. And Abu Dhar actually says that Abu Bakr was more knowledgeable than me. Meaning, it was just part of his abrupt nature. He didn't mean anything by it. But Abu Bakr radiallahu and was wiser. Then the Prophet sallallahu said, how long have you been here? So he said, I've been here for a whole month. And then he said that I have survived only on the water of Zamzam. So the Prophet sallallahu told him, indeed, it's blessed. And it's nourishment for someone who seeks food. Zamzam is nourishment for someone who seeks food and nourishment. And it's blessed. Then the Prophet... Abu Bakr radiallahu an said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, grant me permission to take him to my house and to entertain him and to give him, to feed him. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam granted him permission. So Abu Bakr radiallahu an took him home. And then he said, he gave me raisins. So he says, this was the first solid food I had in a whole month. Raisins. He spent the night with him the next day. They went to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, O oh Abu Dhar, go back to your people and propagate Islam there. But don't say anything here in Mecca. So Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, why should we conceal our faith? And even though the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him to conceal the affair, he went out, went into the haram in broad daylight, and then loudly shouted, 
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله. People fell on him and began beating him. Now, Al Abbas ibn Abd al Muttalib, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's uncle, who still wasn't a Muslim, he came, but who was still supportive of his nephew and the Muslims. He came and he pushed people away and prevented them from continuing to attack and hit Abu Dhar. And the way he did it was warning them and reminding them that do you not realize he's from the tribe of Ghifar? And we all know Ghifar. If you harm him, then his people will harm us and raid and attack our caravan. So leave him. So the people stopped. Abu Dhar radiallahu anh, stayed in Mecca. The next day he came back to the Haram and repeated what he did, did the day before. Again people fell on him and beat him. Again Abbas radiallahu anh, had to intervene and save him using the same argument. That all oh, people do not realize that he's from the tribe of Ghifar. And if he is harmed, then they will harm and attack us and raid our caravans. So again for purely commercial reasons... They backed off. Many talks at the end of the day. So, and Abu Dhar radiallahu anh didn't care one bit for wealth. He was fearless. This is how he was. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith related by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and many others, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا أَقَلَّتِ الْغَبْرَى ولا ما أقلت الغبراء and in some narrations لا أقلت الغبراء ولا أظلت الخضراء من رجل أصدق من أبي ذر that the, the earth has not carried and born any man and nor has the sky sh- sheltered any man more truthful than Abu Dhar. More truthful of tongue than Abu Dhar. And in one narration of Imam Tirmidhi, rahmatullahi alayhi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, the earth has not carried and borne any man, and the sky has not sheltered or covered any man more truthful of tongue than Abu Dhar. He is the like of Isa, the son of Maryam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, actually in more than one hadith we learn, he compared him to, in more than one narration, he compared him to Isa, the son of Maryam alayhi wa sallam. That's how he was. So he was fearless. And he would say whatever he wanted to, whether he was beaten and attacked, whether it was the Quraysh, in before, uh, whether it was the Quraysh when they were non-Muslim, or whether it was the chieftains of the Quraysh after they embraced Islam and became the Sahaba, and long after the time of the Prophet ﷺ. He was fearless. He feared no one in his rebuking. As I said, he was a scholar. And because of one of his opinions, which caused a lot of consternation and disagreement amongst the Sahaba anhum, and because he carried on, well, he continued going around scolding everybody, Uthman radiallahu an had warned him, had told him not to give fatwa, not to answer questions, not to pass fatwa. So he was in Hajj and he was sitting with a group of people and he was answering their religious questions and giving fatwa. So someone came along and said, haven't you been prevented from giving fatwa? So Abu Dhar radiallahu anh looked up at him and said, are you a spy? He said, are you a spy? And then he said to him, listen, if you were to place the samsama, a sword, the samsama was a curved sword, I believe this is where the English word scimitar comes from. Scimitar is a curved Arabian sword. So it's taken from the word samsama. So he said, if you were to place a samsama, a scimitar sword on my neck here. And then I still had the opportunity to relate one hadith to you from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the meaning is, this is my neck. If you were to place the sword here, 
normally when the executioner would execute people by decapitating them, the way they would do it is they would place the sword on the neck, raise it, and then come down with a blow to sever the head. So the first one was to mark and to take aim. So Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu said, if you were to place a samsama, the scimitar sword, on my neck, and then I was still able to relate one hadith to you, one word from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how would that be possible? Meaning, in the interval between you marking my neck and raising the sword and crashing down on me, even in that brief interval, if I can get away with relating one word of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to you, I will. So, this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said of him, that the earth has not borne a man, and the sky has not sheltered a man more truthful of tongue than Abu Dhar. And in the, in the narration of Tirmidhi, he goes on to say, he is the like of Isa, the son of Maryam. Who spoke, and how? Because he spoke the truth, he was fearless in his proclamation of the truth, and he was ascetic, he shunned the world. He was surrounded by wealth, but he did not take part of it, any part of it. So, then, acting on the instruction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu an left Makkah al-Mukarramah. And then, he actually, according to some narrations, he said that the Quraysh have attacked me in Makkah, simply because I declared my Islam, by Allah, they won't be safe from me. So when he ret- retreated to the deserts, he would single-handedly, even after embracing Islam, raid the caravans of the Quraysh in retaliation for them attacking him. In any case, after the Hijrah, he actually didn't join the Prophet ﷺ immediately, but he remained amongst his people. And there, when he returned from Mecca, he met his younger brother Unais. So Unais had been sent by him earlier, so when he now met him, Unais said to him, so what did you find? What have you come back with? Because remember, he, t- he was harsh of tongue, so when Unais had come back from his earlier trip, he said, you haven't brought me anything, I'll have to go myself. So Unais said to him, so then brother, what did you find? So he says, I have come with belief in Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So his brother said, I will not shun a religion that you have adopted. And he embraced Islam. They both went to their mother, and she said, I will not shun a religion which my sons have adopted. She embraced Islam. And then single-handedly through Abu Dhar radiallahu an, within a short while, half of his tribe embraced Islam. <coughs> half. And then the remaining half, they were sympathetic. But they said, we, we will not embrace Islam till the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does hijrah meaning comes to Medina. And this obviously must have been at a late stage. Eventually, when the Prophet ﷺ did perform the hijrah, the whole tribe of Ghifar embraced Islam. Then Abu Dhar came and resided in Medina. And this was actually after a few years, because he wasn't part of the Battle of Badr or Uhud. Some say he arrived in the fifth year of hijrah and permanently and stayed in Medina. Now, when he stayed in Medina, where did he take up residence? He was one of the Ashabu Sufa, one of the companions of the veranda, one of the companions of the porch, where the poor Sahaba radiallahu anhum would stay. And there they would be the guests of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, learning from him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam trusted him, he confided in him, he held him close and dear. He, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved him, he told others to love him. In a hadith related by the companion Buraida radiallahu an, by a number of authors including Imam Tirmidhi in his sunan, Buraida radiallahu an who says, and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Buraida radiallahu an who says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to me, to love four companions, for he loves them and they love him. So I said to him, who are they, O Messenger of Allah? So the Prophet wasallam said thrice, Ali, Ali, Ali. And then Abu Dhar and Salman, meaning Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Salman meaning Salman al-Farsi. And Miqdad meaning al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. 
Then he repeated, Love them, for I love them and they love me. So, indeed, he loved him. And for the time that he remained in Medina, he was a simple companion following in the footsteps of the Prophet wasallam, spending time with him. In fact, in the Battle of Hunayn, he was with him at the conquest of Mecca. And after the conquest of Mecca in the Battle of Hunayn, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari brought the support of the Ghifar tribe. And he was actually the leader of the whole Ghifar tribe in the campaign of Hunayn. After the Prophet ﷺ passed away, and in fact before that, we had that famous occasion when in the Battle of Tabuk, Tabuk in the ninth year of Hijrah was a watershed moment. The reason it was a watershed is because till then, many things were concealed. So it was the Prophet ﷺ's own custom that whenever he would travel on a, camp, on a military expedition, then he would dissimulate. He would conceal his intended direction in order to confuse the enemy. But in Tabuk, he made it clear. Because for the first time, they needed a huge army in order to march northwards to face a Byzantine Roman army. So the Prophet ﷺ made his intentions clear. As we studied in the hadith of Ka'b ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu, Another reason for this watershed, for, for Tabuk being a watershed, is that until that time, the affair of the Munafiqeen, the hypocrites, was still unclear. It was very difficult to see who was actually a hypocrite. But as some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, the topic of Tabuk created a stark division. This is why Ka'b ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu himself says, as we covered in the hadith, that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had left, there was no one remaining behind in Medina except those who had already been excused, the women folk, the chil- children, the invalids, and a man who was blatant in his hypocrisy. إِلَّا رَجُلٌ مَعْلُومٌ النِّفَاقٌ except a man who was known for his hypocrisy. This is why the Sahaba, in fact, many of the hypocrites still went. Some of them returned, some of them lagged behind. But Tabuk was an occasion when it was watershed and things were made very clear. So on the journey, some of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, at their halts, they would stop and discuss that where is such and such a person, where is Funa, where is Funa, where is such and such a person. So sometimes they would say it's in the presence of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they would say that where is such and such a person? So someone would say he is a hypocrite. Why? Because only the hypocrites had remained behind. So the Prophet ﷺ would tell them, do not say that. If there is good in him, then Allah will bring him. And if there is no good in him, then you will be relieved of him. So on that occasion, someone said about Abu Dhar radiallahu and where is Abu Dhar? So again, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu was missing because he had lagged behind. He was coming on his camel, but on his mount, but it lagged behind. So Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, what he had done is he left his camel and he continued with his journey on foot through the deserts, following the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this campaign of Tabuk. And he took the luggage off the camel and bore it on his back and he walked. So he was missing. So people questioned. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the same. If there is good in him, he will come. Then... Once the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were seated with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the deserts up north, in the north of Arabia. And through the shimmering heat and the mirage, from the distance, they saw the figure, the solitary figure of a man walking. So someone said, there is someone coming. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately exclaimed, Kun Aba Dhar, let it be Abu Dhar. Or, He's actually said, Kun Abadhar, that oh you be Abu Dhar. 
So when he came closer, indeed, it was none other than Abu Dhar radiallahu an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said of him, May Allah have mercy on Abu Dhar. He walks alone, he shall die alone, and he shall be resurrected alone. So Abu Dhar an joined the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and continued, After the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, Abu Dhar radiallahu an went up north to Sham. And he participated in a number of the campaigns against the Byzantine Romans. And he was also with Umar ibn al-Khattab at the conquest or the handing over of the keys of Bayt al-Maqdis. When some of the campaigns came to a halt and things settled in Sham, especially during the time of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu an, when Muawiyah radiallahu an became the governor of Sham and his headquarters were in Damascus in Dimashq, Abu Dhar radiallahu an was there. Now a number of the leading Sahaba radiallahu anhum in Sham, like the other Muslims, because of the sudden influx of wealth and the treasures from the conquest of Persia and Rome, Byzantine Rome. Wealth flowed in to the coffers and the treasury of the Muslim lands and trickled down individually to the common Muslims and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So a number of Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they began living relatively comfortably, I wouldn't say in opulence or luxury, but relatively comfortably compared to their past life. So Abu Dhar radiallahu an was very concerned about this and very critical. We learnt in the story of Abu Ubaidat ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu an, a remarkable Sahabi. Relatively little is known about him, but he was a truly unique individual. And he was the overall, he was commander, the commander-in-chief of all the armed forces uh, of the Muslims in Shah. Even Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, uh, despite being the greatest general, he was uh, an, a subordinate to Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah. He was made uh, a sub, and Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an was his emir. But it was the simplicity and the humility of Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an that he accepted the instruction of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an and the demotion of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an but Abu Dhar radiallahu an continued to respect Khalid ibn al-Walid and not only that but even though nominally he was a commander he left all strategy and planning to Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an and Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu, he was the overall commander, he was the overall governor and emir. And all the wealth flowed into the coffers of the Muslims. When Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, went to Dimashq to meet the Sahaba, to review his commanders, his followers, the forces, and the center of rule and government in, D- in Damascus. Publicly, he said to Abu Ubaidat ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu an, Abu Ubaidah, take me to your house. So Abu Ubaidah said, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, why do you wish to come to my house? You will only embarrass me. So he said, Umar radiallahu an, who said, take me. So he took Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu, oh, so Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu took him to his house. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was one of his best friends. He loved him. He loved Abu Ubaidah. So when he went to his house, he entered. And this is the house of the governor and the commander of the whole of Sham, the conqueror of Sham. And he lived in such simplicity. When he saw when he allowed his eyes to roam in the house of Abu Ubaidah, he saw nothing. Then he said to him, what do you eat? Bring us some provisions, bring us some food. 
So Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an brought him dry nuts and dry savouries, no proper food. He says, this is what I have. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu wept. And he said to Abu Ubaidah, O oh Abu Ubaidah, the dunya, the world has touched every one of us except you. So I remember this story because, because of the conquest. Even Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu said to Abu Ubaidah, the dunya, the world has touched every one of us except you. So wealth flowed. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu was very critical. And he would scold anyone who he felt was living comfortably. And he held an opinion. And that opinion was that the verse of the Holy Quran in Surah At-Tawbah, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّةَ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرْهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ يَوْمَ يُحْمَى عَلَيْهَا فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمْ فتكوى بها جباههم وجنوبهم وظهورهم هذا ما كنستم لأنفسكم فذوقوا ما كنتم تكنزون. Allah says and those who hoard gold and silver and do not spend it in the way of Allah, then give them the glad tidings of a painful punishment. On the day. When the same gold and silver, this treasure, will be heated in the fire of Jahannam and melted. And then with this heated and melted treasure, their sides, their, their foreheads and their sides, and their backs shall be singed, stamped and burnt. And it will be said to them, this is what you hoarded for yourselves. So taste what you used to hoard. So because of this verse, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum agreed, and Muslims have agreed since then, that hoarding is haram. Treasure is harmful. And guns, guns meaning treasure, hoarding. But even the Sahaba radiallahu anhum differed as to what guns meant. So guns means hoarded treasure. But what constitutes guns? What constitutes hoarded treasure? So even say that when this verse was revealed, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were very fearful. And this bore down heavily on them because their understanding of the verse was that you could not keep anything. If you kept any wealth or savings, then that is hoarded treasure. So this was difficult for them. They said, how can we leave wealth for our children after us? So Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu said, do not grieve. Let me go to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and find out the reality of this. So Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, this verse has borne down weightily and heavily on your companions. For they fear that they will not be able to save for themselves or for their children after them. So the Prophet ﷺ said, this is not it. Allah has instructed you to give zakah so that zakah will purify your wealth and allow you to keep your wealth by have, after having purified it. So once you've paid the zakah, you can keep the remainder of the wealth. And then the Prophet ﷺ added, and Allah has only made the shares of inheritance obligatory so that you can save for your children after death. Otherwise, if this was the meaning of the verse, you wouldn't, there would be no concept of inheritance. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were relieved. And this was the understanding of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. That guns, which is warned against in the hadith, and especially in this verse of the Quran, hoarded treasure, pining up treasure, which is warned against in this verse of the Quran, simply refers to that wealth which has not been purified by paying zakah. 
Once the zakah of wealth has been paid, it's been purified. As Allah says, in خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةٌ تُطَاحِرُهُمْ That take from their wealth such charity. Take from their wealth such charity that through this charity you purify them and you cleanse them. So the wealth is cleansed, the wealth is purified, and one can keep that wealth. This was the understanding of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. But Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, because of his asceticism and because of his unrelenting, uncompromising nature, he sincerely was of the opinion, since he was a man of knowledge. And I mentioned at the beginning that one of the reasons for speaking about Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu is that he was a great scholar in his own right. So much so that it was said he rivaled Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu in knowledge. However, and even Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said of him that he is a container that has been filled with knowledge but it has been sealed. Because Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu wouldn't reveal his knowledge. And he took it with him to the grave. And especially because he was uncompromising and relentless on this one issue which brought him into conflict and disagreement with so many people. As a result of which even Uthman radiallahu anhu had to tell him not to preach publicly. But he didn't desist. But apart from that, because of his harsh, uncompromising, or because of his nature, because of his unrelenting, uncompromising nature, and because of his coarseness of speech, he was unlike Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu or the other Sahaba radiallahu anhu who were able to disseminate knowledge. Otherwise, in terms of his own wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, he rivaled Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and even Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said of him that he is a container filled with knowledge but which has been sealed. So, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he sincerely held this opinion that guns is any treasure which a person keeps for himself, any wealth which a person keeps for himself, even a savings, beyond his immediate need. Beyond his immediate need. And that was his belief. Even if a person paid zakah on it, so if a person had wealth and he paid zakah, still Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu said the wealth is purified, but he cannot keep it. He must give it in the way of Allah. He must spend it and he must share it. It's haram for him to keep. And that was his opinion. And he wouldn't just keep this opinion to himself. As I said, when he was in Mad- uh, Dimashq, Damascus, and he saw the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, some of them living comfortably, he would scold every one of them. Let, leave alone the others. Let aside the others. He would rebuke Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, who was a governor. He would go by his house or palace every day and loudly proclaim whatever he wanted to. Every day at the doors. And Muawiyah radiallahu anhu was utterly frustrated with him. He didn't know what to do. He would invite other Sahaba radiallahu anhu, Amr ibn al-As, Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, and even Umm Haram. And he would, he would say, look, he is a companion, we are companions. He was with the messenger, we were with the messenger. He heard exactly what you heard from the messenger. Why does he do this? Will someone try to explain to him? So Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he was summoned and all of these sahaba sat with him. And he replied to every one of them. He was very... As for Umm Haram, he says, you, you're just a woman. And as for the others, he said, Abu Darda. 
He said to Amr ibn al-As, he said to Abu Darda, O oh Abu Darda, you only became, you were about to miss the janazah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you only became Muslim late. So he was very, but still, he said this to Abu Darda radiyallahu, he wouldn't listen to anybody. He would say what he wanted to these sahaba were brought by Muawiyah radiyallahu to explain to him, and instead of accepting what they had to say, he replied to every one of them. And then Abu Darda radiyallahu anhu said, By Allah, I will never ever sit in such a gathering again. So Muawiyah radi, and I'll tell you, even though he said this to Abu Darda, Abu Darda radiyallahu anhu never held anything against him. This is why I said the Sahaba viewed him in a unique light. So Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu became utterly frustrated with him. So he sent him to Medina. He wrote to Uthman radiyallahu anhu saying, Look, what do we do? Will you please call him to Medina? So Uthman radiallahu an instructed Abu Dhar radiallahu an to come to Medina. And there he would again continue with his campaign, warning everyone against the danger of hoarding treasure, of hoarding wealth. And he lived by that himself. One tabi'i says that I saw Abu Dhar and his annual share was given to him. His annual stipend was given to him. And he had a maid with him. So he said to the maid, here, take the money, buy whatever we need. Immediately. <laughs> when everything was purchased, there was money left. He said, break this into smaller coins. I change this into smaller coins. He refused to keep... Gold. Break this into smaller coins. So the Tabi'i says, I said to Abu Dhar, oh, Abu Dhar, why don't you keep the money with you? Why don't you keep the money with you just in case you may need it afterwards? And he refused. He said, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade that wealth should be kept. And in one narration it's mentioned more clearly he says, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu says, I heard the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that what Abu Dhar, if I had the equivalent of Mount Uhud in gold, the whole of Mount Uhud in gold, I would not allow three days to pass without all of it being spent in the way of Allah. Unless I had to keep some in order to repay a debt. It's a hadith of Bukhari. If I had the equivalent of Mount Uhud in gold, I would not allow three, the third night to fall upon me without spending all of it in the way of Allah unless I had to reserve some in order to repay a debt. So Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he lived an ascetic life and he was fearful and critical of government and of leadership. And what I mean by government is not the apparent, uh, apparatus, but more any individual who aspired to be a leader. <coughs> because he himself, he says that once I was with the Messenger وسلم, and I said to him, Ya Rasulullah, Meaning, will you not make me an amil? Will you not make me a governor or an amir over any region? So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, O oh Abu Dhar, إِنَّكَ ضعيف. You are weak. وَإِنَّهَا أَمَانَةَ وَإِنَّهَا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ خِزْيٌ وَنَدَامَةَ He said, O oh Abu Dhar, you are weak. And this responsibility of leadership is a trust and on the day of judgment it will be a disgrace and regret why unless then the hadith continues unless someone fulfills its rights because anyone who becomes a leader anyone who becomes a leader I mean even if you become a leader of three people anyone who assumes a position of responsibility or leadership wherein they are now responsible for other people's wealth and other people's lives, this is a great amana and trust on their necks. 
So someone like Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, you are weak. Even you will not be able to fulfill the right of such a great trust of leadership and of being a governor. So he declined. This is why Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu was fearful of leadership. And even amongst the leaders, if he saw them failing to fulfill the amana and the trust, he would unhesitatingly and unabashedly, he would scold them and criticize them. So when he arrived in Medina, even in Dimashq, he lived that life. Even in Medina, he lived that life. He wouldn't keep any wealth with him, except the clothes he had, the food he ate, and what he had for his family. And as I said, he was unrelenting. He would. Muawiyah radiallahu an didn't know what to do. So he sent him to Medina. There in Medina, he continued with his preaching. And he had one subject. This was it. It's haram for everybody to hoard wealth and to keep any wealth, even if they pay zakah on it. And more than, more than one occasion, Uthman radiallahu an tried to explain to him. And he would scold Uthman radiallahu an. And on more than one occasion, Ka'b al-Ahbar was a Jewish rabbi. Ka'b al-Ahbar, he was a Jewish rabbi. He wasn't a companion, he wasn't a sahabi. He was a Jewish rabbi who didn't come to Medina till after the Prophet ﷺ passed away during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. So he came, he embraced Islam, and because he was a Jewish rabbi, he became quite learned in Islamic tradition as well. And he would sit with Uthman ibn Affan عن, and the other Sahaba. So Ka'b al-Ahbar, he was with Uthman عن, And Abu Dhar عن, he would say whatever he wanted to. So he said to Uthman عن, didn't you hear the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say this, say this, say this. Tell me, O oh Uthman, didn't you? Uthman radiallahu anhu would keep quiet. Tell me, didn't you? Three times he asked him. Then the discussion arose about this verse of the Quran of Surah At-Tawbah. And you see, the words, وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبُ وَالْفِضَّةِ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرْهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ And those who do not spend, those who hoard gold and silver and do not spend it in the way of Allah, then give them the glad tidings of a painful punishment. This is actually the second half of the verse. The words begin in the middle of the verse. The full verse, the beginning is, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ الْأَحْبَارِ وَالرُّحْبَانِ لَيَأْكُلُونَ أَمْوَالَ النَّاسِ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَيُسُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبُ وَالْفِضَّةِ The O believers, verily, many of the rabbis and the monks, they devour the wealth of people unlawfully. And they prevent people from the way of Allah. And those who hoard gold and silver. So this is the full verse. Those who hoard gold and silver. And do not spend it in the way of Allah. Then give them the glad tidings of a painful punishment. So what happened is. Uthman and was seated in his. He was seated with Abu Dhar radiallahu an, and Ka'b al-Ahbar, this scholar who wasn't a companion, but who was a former Jewish rabbi from Yemen, and then who came and embraced Islam during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, but he was, a, who was one of those who sat with the senior sahaba. So Uthman radiallahu an, when the discussion arose about this verse, and about guns and about treasure, again, Abu Dhar radiallahu an said to Uthman radiallahu an, tell me this verse, what do you have to say about it? Does not Allah say this is treasure? Why do you allow people to hoard wealth and keep wealth? So Uthman radiallahu an said, ask Ka'b al-Ahbar what's the meaning of this verse? So Ka'b al-Ahbar said, this verse is not related to us, it's related to the former peoples. Because Allah speaks of them at the beginning of the verse. So Abu Dhar radiallahu an took his stick and whacked him on the head. Quite harshly, according to one narration, he made him bleed. In front of Uthman radiallahu an, he took it out and struck him. 
and then verbally abused him, saying, Yabni al Yahudiyah, O oh, son of a Jewess, how dare you? And then he argued with him in front of Uthman. <laughs> Eventually, even Uthman <laughs> had to prevent him from preaching, and they came to an agreement that. Abu Dhar would not stay in Medina. So he went back to Rabada. His own Rabada, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a region where his tribe lived and where he had spent his youth amongst the Banu Ghifar. So he was, in a way, exiled to Rabada. So Uthman, when he called him back from Dimashq, in a way, Muawiyah had exiled him. He had banished him from Damascus. And remember what I said about Abu Darda radiallahu an. So Abu Darda radiallahu an was away from Damascus in a region of Sham when someone went to meet him, one of the Tabi'i. And news reached Abu Darda radiallahu an. He asked that how are things in Damascus? He says this, this. He goes, it's good news, but I have one sad piece of news to relate to you. So Abu Darda radiallahu anh, looked at this messenger and said, Is it about Abu Dhar? So he said, Yes. So he said, Has he been exiled and banished from Damascus? So he said, Yes. So Abu Darda radiallahu anh, the same one who Abu Dhar had scolded so harshly, Abu Darda radiallahu anh, who said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un Ten times. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un And after uttering inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un ten, Over ten times. Abu Darda radiallahu anhu said Even if they reject and belie him, I will not reject him. Even if they accuse him, I will not accuse him. Even if they regard him as untrustworthy, I will not regard him as, un- as untrustworthy. And he said, by Allah, even if Abu Dhar had cut off my hand, I will not hold it against him. After what I heard the Messenger wasallam say about him, that the earth has not borne or carried any man, or the sky has not sheltered any man of a more truthful tongue than Abu Dhar. So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, even though they were at the receiving end of his campaign and his message, he, they would not say anything to him. So he was, he was exiled from Damascus, then he was exiled from Medina, and he went to live in Rabada. And he didn't mind. Because this was prophesied by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He once came into the masjid, he was sleeping. So he lovingly kicked him. So he woke up. So he told him, Oh Abu Dhar, what will you do? When, after my time, what will you do? So he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I will go to Shah. And I will join the Muslims in their campaigns. And the Prophet wasallam said, And then, she says, I will remain in Shah. That's the place of emigration of the Prophets because Ibrahim السلام, emigrated from Iraq to Sham. So he said, I will stay in Sham, the emigrating place of the Prophets. So the Prophet وسلم, said, and when they drive you from there, so he says, I will come back to Medina. And he says, when they drive you from here, so he said, O Messenger of Allah, I will... I will go. And then he said something because of which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said I will he said I will contest them. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said oh Abu Dhar should I not tell you something even better than this? He said what's our messenger of Allah? He said obey them and listen to them. Do not oppose them. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had prophesied his final days. So Abu Dhar radiallahu an was exiled and he went to live in Rabada. There with his small family, according to some reports, only his wife and only his one daughter. He lived in Rabada. Occasionally he would come to Medina.
and just for a visit, then he'd go back, but he wouldn't stay. And there, as I said, Rabba there is about 120 miles east of Medina, he would live there. He lived his days in simplicity, in poverty. And he practiced what he preached. He considered it haram for others and haram for himself to keep any wealth, even a single filth, even a single penny, beyond his immediate need. And remember, he was harsh of tongue. That's why he said to Ka'b al-Ahbar, Ibn al O son of Jewess, he, he was harsh of tongue because he would say things. And uh, I'll give you another example of what he would say. Someone said that, we, it's again, it's a hadith of Bukhari, we saw, Ka'ab, uh, sorry, we saw Abu Dhar al-Ghifari with one of his servants, not servants, but one of his young people who was attendants. So he said, both of them were wearing the same, one half of a suit. So he was wearing one cloth, and the, the, man, the, the, the man who was working with him, he was wearing the other cloth. So I said to him, why don't you join these two and make a suit? Because in Arabic, hulla, hulla means a suit, and a suit is a pair. Something, two pieces of cloth that go together. But what Abu Dhar had done, is that the suit he had split into two. So he wore one half and he gave the other half to his companion. So someone said, why don't you take that off him and you wear both pieces of the suit so that you have a complete suit? So he said, no. So he said, why? He said, shall I tell you the story? He said, I had a worker once. So I scolded him. And I said to him, Yibn al-Sawda, and according to one narration, Yibn al-A'jamiyya, O son of a non-Arab woman, O son of a black woman. So he went and complained to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam summoned me and became extremely angry, and he said, "O Abu Dhar, inna kamroon fi kajahiliya. You are a man in whom there is jahiliya and ignorance." So, so Abu Dhar radiyallahu an being Abu Dhar, he said to him, O Messenger of Allah, even in this old age of mine? So he said, yes, even now. You are a man in whom there is jahiliya. Then he said, these servants and slaves, and your freed slaves, they are your brothers in religion. Feed them of what you eat, dress them of what you dress. Do not burden them with work. And if you happen to give them more work than they can carry out, assist them in their work. So he said, ever since I heard that from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my workers, I feed them what I eat, I dress them in what I dress myself. So he lived according to that. He lived by what he preached. And towards the end of his days, he, he received a stipend, but he did live very, very simply. And then eventually, he fell ill. His wife was weeping. He said to her, do not weep for the Messenger of Allah prophesies this. And he told me. And then he said, when I die, remember I said Rabba was on the route to Iraq. The pilgrims and the trade caravans from Iraq would, on their way to Mecca, they would pass by Rabba So he said, he lived on that. Obviously, then he began living on the outskirts of Rabba all alone. So he said that, when I die, take my body out into, onto the road and wait for a group who will come and tell them who I am and tell them to pray Salat al over me. So when he eventually passed away, The family waited, his wife waited. He had no son. His son had died earlier. They waited and there was a caravan traveling for pilgrimage from Iraq, a group of Muslims. And as they drew close, his wife called them and she said, come and assist me and pray Salatul Janazah over my husband. 
So the leader of that group was none other than Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu So he said, who is he? So they said, she said, this is Abu Dhar. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu an loudly exclaimed, Allahu Akbar. True is the word of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Dhar, he walks alone, he shall die alone, and he shall be resurrected alone. So he performed Salatul Janazah over him. And this was in the 32nd year of Hijrah. And it's said that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu an carried on. And then he lived only for a short while after that himself. So Abu Dhar radiyallahu an passed on from this world in that state. Allahu Akbar. He lived a life of simplicity. He lived a fearless life of proclaiming the truth. But the greatest lesson of his life was this. His shunning of wealth, his belief that it's not permissible for a person to hoard and to gather and accumulate any more wealth than is required to meet his immediate needs. And in that, he upset many Sahaba radiallahu anhum. But he lived by that, he preached that, and he acted on it. And his life was a shining example of asceticism, of simplicity. And as I said, he was a great scholar, but his zuhd overshadows his scholarship in the eyes of everyone, in the sense that he was a scholar as well, but he was such a great zahid and ascetic and unworldly that that seemed to cover everything else about him. And he left a great lesson for everyone. And remarkably, he is one of those Sahaba radiallahu anhum who, even those who criticize the Sahaba wrongfully, and sadly, who even abuse the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they do not have a bad word to say about Abu Dhar radiallahu anhum. So, a remarkable individual. A lot can be said about him, but for us, the greatest lesson is his zuhd, his unworldliness, his asceticism. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described him as being like Isa, the son of Maryam, in his simplicity and truthful of tongue. Finally, he narrates many ahadith from Rasulullah alayhi salatu wa salam. And one of the hadith which he relates is a very, very beautiful one, which Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi relates in his sahih. And which, inshallah, I will comment on in one of the upcoming weeks. And I'll end with this hadith. It's a hadith of Sahih Muslim. And Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu relates it. And Abu Idris al-Khawlani, he relates from Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. Abu Idris al-Khawlani was the student of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. And Abu Idris al one of the narrators of the hadith says that whenever Abu Idris al-Khawlani would relate this hadith, he would kneel on his knees. He would kneel and relate it in submission and in humility. And the hadith is, عن أبي إدريس الخولاني عن أبي ذر الغفاري عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما روى عن الله تبارك وتعالى قال From Abu Idris الخولاني, from Abu Dhar الغفاري, from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم From Allah, the Exalted and the Almighty. That the Prophet ﷺ related from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah said, Ya ibadi inni harramtu dhulma ala nafsi wajaltuhu baynakum muharraman fala tadhalam. Ya ibadi kullukum dhalun illa man hadaytuhu fastahduni ahdikum. Ya ibadi kullukum ja'iun illa man at'amtuhu fastat'imuni ut'imkum. يا عبادي كلكم عار إلا من كسوته فاستكسوني أكسكم يا عبادي إنكم لن تبلغوا ضري فتضروني ولن تبلغوا نفعي فتنفعوني يا عبادي إنكم تخطئون بالليل والنهار وأنا أغفر الذنوب جميعا فاستغفروني أغفر لكم يا عبادي 
لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم كانوا على أتقى قلب رجل واحد منكم ما زاد ذلك في ملكي شيئا يا عبادي لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم كانوا على أفجر قلب رجل واحد ما نقص ذلك من ملكي شيئا يا عبادي لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم قاموا في سعيد واحد فسألوني فأعطيت كل إنسان مسألته ما نقص ذلك مما عندي إلا كما ينقص المخيط إذا أدخل البحر يا عبادي إنما هي أعمالكم أحصيها لكم ثم أوفيكم إياها فمن وجد خيرا فليحمد الله ومن وجد غير ذلك فلا يلومن إلا نفسه نص حديث رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم سيز أنزع سيد أبو إدريس الخولاني رضي رحمة الله عليه ونبي هو رولي this حديث from the famous companion Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu an, he would kneel in doing so. Who relates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, O oh my servants, I have made injustice forbidden to myself, therefore do not be unjust to one another. O my servants, every one of you is lost, except for one whom I guide, therefore seek guidance from me. O my servants, every one of you is hungry, except for one whom I feed, therefore seek sustenance from me. I shall feed you. O my servants, Every one of you is unclothed, except one whom I clothe and protect and shelter. Therefore seek shelter from me, and I shall provide shelter and concealment for you. O oh my servants, you sin day and night, and I forgive all sin. Therefore seek forgiveness from me, I shall forgive you your sins. O my servants, you will never be able to reach the degree of harming me. And you will never be able to reach the degree of benefiting me. O my servants, if the first and the last, the men and the jinn amongst you, were all to be as pious as the most pious-hearted man amongst you, this would not increase anything in my kingdom. O my servants, if the first and the last, the men and the jinn amongst you, were all to be as sinful as the most sinful person amongst you, this would not reduce anything from my kingdom. O my servants, if the first and the last, and the men and the jinn amongst you, were all to gather in one plane, and then all of them were to ask me of what they wanted, and then I gave all, all that they wanted, this would not reduce from my kingdom, except as much as a needle reduces from the water of the ocean when it's dipped in and removed. O my servants, these are but your deeds, and I am enumerating them for you. Then I shall requite you in full for what you have done. So whoever finds good in his book of deeds, then let him praise Allah. And whoever finds other than good in his book of deeds, فَلَا يَلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهُ Then let him blame and rebuke no one but himself. So th- this is that famous hadith of Abu Dhar radiyallahu an. This is just an example of many of the ahadith that Abu Dhar anhu related, a truly learned and pious and ascetic sahabi radiyallahu an. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to learn from the example of the noble companions radiyallahu anhum. May Allah make us amongst those who, just like Abu Ubaidat ibn al-Jarrah, and Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu anhuma, and the other sahaba radiyallahu anhum too, who were not affected by the dunya, regardless of whether they had it in their hands or not. 
wealth, as Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, ليس الغنى عن كثرة العرض ولكن الغنى غنى القلب Richness is not the excess of possessions. Richness is the richness of the heart. So richness and poverty, wealth and poverty are measured by the heart. If a man is rich in heart, whether he is poor or rich of hand is immaterial. And if a man is poor of heart, then whether he is rich or poor of hand is immaterial. Because he may have nothing in the hand, but if his heart is rich and content, then he is happy. But he may have the world in his hand, but if his heart is poor, then he will continue to hanker after wealth, disrupt the quality of his life, lose sleep, be distressed, even though he has it in hand, because he is poor of heart. And then Mount Uhud of gold. And forget Mount Uhud, as I mentioned before, and I'll end with this, Imam Bukhari and others all relate from a number of Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, including Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiyallahu anhu, who announced on the member of Mecca, he said, I heard the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, say, he would say, that the Messenger, sorry, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, that, لو أن ابن آدم أعطي واديا ملأ من ذهب من ذهب لا أحب إليه ثانية ولو أعطي ثانيا لا أحب إليه ثالثة ولا يسد جوف ابن آدم إلا التراب ويتوب الله على من تاب. The Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said, if man had a valley full of gold, he would desire a second. If man was given a valley full filled with gold. He would desire a second. If he was given a second, he would desire a third. And nothing can fill the cavity in man except the dust of the earth. And Allah relents and turns to someone in mercy who himself turns to Allah. So greed, the greed of the heart is such that Mount Uhud of gold would not be sufficient. A mountain of gold will not be sufficient. Even one valley, even two valleys, even three valleys will not be sufficient. And we may think nothing of it, a valley of gold, two valleys of gold. But consider this hadith in light of what I mentioned uh, before. That they say that in the entire history of humanity, the total amount of gold mined from the earth, the total amount of gold mined from the earth will only fill two Olympic swimming pools. Sorry, four Olympic swimming pools. It, or they will only f fill approximately two football fields. So the entire gold ever excavated and mined in the whole history of human civilization will only fill two football fields. And not in height just a few feet, or maybe two feet, and in spread, two football fields. And that's all the gold in the world. Not today, but in the, in the entire history of mankind. So whether you regard it as two football fields, or approximately three and a half swimming pools, Olympic-sized swimming pools, that's 50 meters across, sorry, 25 meters across, 50 meters in length, and two meters height. Two Olympic swimming pools, that's it. And in contrast to that, the Prophet وسلم, says, forget two Olympic swimming pools, three, three and a half, four Olympic swimming pools, forget two football fields, forget a mountain. Imagine a whole valley filled with gold between two mountain ranges. You still wouldn't be happy. You'd want a second. And if you were given a second, you still wouldn't be happy. You'd want a third. Because nothing can quench this thirst of wealth in man. Nothing can fill this cavity. We have a cavity in us. We have an emptiness in us. This is the meaning of that cavity. Nothing can fill. Jawf doesn't mean stomach. Jawf means emptiness. Now, because the stomach is empty, you can call the stomach jawf. Jawf means the inside, which is filled with air. Emptiness. So nothing can fill this emptiness in us, except the dust of the earth. 
So we either fill it with the dust of the earth or fill it with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one thing that can fill that emptiness. But not wealth. And a believer is such that if Allah gives him wealth, wealth passes through his hands. Yes, it can come through his hands, but his heart is not attached to it. So whether he is poor or whether he is rich, it's the same. His heart remains the same. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were like that. Those who were poor, their hearts were similar to those who were rich. Because their richness and their poverty were ultimately in their hearts. Meaning their richness was in their hearts and their hands, regardless of whether they were poor or rich, they were the same. Allah allow us to follow in their footsteps. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasooli nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ahlihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.